Um, this is the first uh, departmental seminar of the linguistics department this year, um, and we are very pleased to have a very distinguished and um, and a, a, you know, a good friend as well as speaker. This is uh, Cheke Gethur, who is a colleague from the Africa department. Um, he is senior lecturer <coughs> in Swahili, and he has worked quite a bit on on Spanish, as it were, Spanish and Swahili. He's, he's written a dictionary Spanish Swahili. Um, he's worked in Mexico, was based in Mexico for, for some years, um, and has, has written a monograph on um, Afro-Mexican relations, which is interesting because lots of African-American interaction often focuses on Brazil. And Mexico was up to that monograph, really a bit of a dark spot on the, lands, on the landscape, um, and, and now it isn't anymore. Um, but the other, the other big research um, focus of Cheng's work is Sheng, um, which he will explain in more detail. It's, it's an, an urban African youth language, if I can. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. This agreement, yeah. I, I probably won't. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, it's all right. Uh, but it's spoken in Kenya, we agree on that. Uh, yeah. um, and he has a, a 2002 article, I think, in the Journal of African Cultural uh, Studies, and, uh, which yes. is our own journal, actually, of the African department. Um, and that is still probably one of the key references in the discussion in Sheng. If you look at the, the Sheng literature, this is one of the, one of the articles which is cited. Um, so we're very pleased to have Sheng with us today to open the seminar series and talk about Sheng, and in particular about the logic and impact of Sheng on Kenya's linguistic landscape. Yes. Thank, you thank, thank you very much, Luz, for a wonderful introduction. Uh, indeed, I'm uh, quite happy to be here to talk with you about uh, my ongoing project. As Lutz has mentioned, uh, <clears throat> this, it has become a very topical uh, issue now in the language studies of, uh, in Kenya and East Africa in general. Uh, a dozen, 10, 12 years ago, when I published the article first time, uh, there was only another two articles prior to that. Right? The one was 1987, the next one was 1997, and then mine was in 2002. And hopefully there will be another one soon on my part. I'm actually working with it in impress, so to speak. Um, but Currently, there are conferences, workshops, and uh, many other activities <clears throat> all around Sheng, uh, this, this uh, Sheng project. And part of the reason, I think, and I will explain as we go on, is that um, <clears throat> at the very beginning, it has always been defined as uh, a peer language that is ever-changing, ever-evolving, unstable, uh, non-permanent, and so forth. However, 15 years have gone by, 20 years have gone by, and Sheng, instead of dwindling in numbers and scope and domains of use, is actually increasing. And so this is why I think there is a renewed uh, um, <clears throat> interest uh, on, this, on this phenomenon. Um, right, so <clears throat> how much time do we have? Sorry, just to... So I think we have to leave the room by, by five. So oh, well. about 45 minutes to an hour for, for, for both. And that would give us 20 minutes, half an hour more for that's probably more than enough. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So um, I, dis I thought uh, of talking about the logic in a, in a double kind of sense. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of the, 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 the logic of using uh, the logic of the language itself. We all know that languages have structure and they have uh, uh, a specific way that they have been uh, formulated. So one of the uh, points raised many times was that Sheng has no rules, right? It is, you know, uh, fluid, it is all changing and so forth. And I want to argue that there's a bit more to that, uh, there's more than that. Secondly, um, I want to try to explain the logic of why the Sheng, what is <clears throat> an inner city youth uh, language associated with the underclass, is on the rise. You know, there has to be some explanation for that. There has to be a reason for this. And this is what I'm going to try to explain, the logic as to why Sheng continues to rise. But very briefly, uh, is a background. Uh, <clears throat> this is <clears throat> my working definition for, uh, for, for the time. Hasn't changed very much, except that now uh, <clears throat> I am going to uh, add a few more things to, to the subject. But really, it is, at the time anyway, an age-marked urban dialect of Kenyan Swahili, which I thought whose out of form was very, is, is pigeon-like. At the time, again, there was a lot of discussion about whether Sheng is a pigeon, or some people even proposed it to be a Creole. So in actual fact, that article I wrote, it was in the form of a question. Is Sheng a youth language, a pigeon, or an emerging Creole? And my response was this one in conclusion. Um, Sheng is very much linked to multilingualism and urban 
uh, urban cultures. So it has arisen from a very complex multilingual situation found in Nairobi, which I'm going to, to describe very briefly uh, uh, in, uh, very soon. Sharing the main characteristic, as with many other mixed codes, is code mixing. Um, a lot of lexical and now phonological innovations. Uh, according to Spiropoulos, who wrote the very first article in the Oxford Journal of, 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 uh, Oxford Journal of, of, uh, of uh, Anthropology, um, uh, she claimed that um, there are, uh, she thought that the uh, Shang as a mixed code, as an urban mixed code, had its roots in Nairobi as far back as the 1940s, just before, uh, during that, you know, still during the, the colonial period, when lots of you know people from different ethnicities were housed together in uh, uh, you know sort of somewhat segregated conditions in the city of Nairobi, and so the, the the language that emerged out of a people who had not a common language and also whose competence in the languages is, in the in the languages the common languages that is Swahili and English was quite reduced. So they came up with something that could accommodate all the different speakers uh, at the time. And this uh, has, has not been disputed very much. But again, on the other hand, there isn't much evidence of that because we don't have many speakers reporting to have been speaking that language at the time. Def however, we cannot argue about the, the fact that it is a product uh, of the coexistence of speakers of many different uh, languages who are further differentiated by culture and social economic class. These two factors are also important. One, culture, because Again, uh, we tend to <laughs> oversimplify the situation in Africa that is as if one African culture. But within Kenya, within Africa, there are a great diversity of cultures. So even within the city of Nairobi, you have quite diverse uh, people with very diverse uh, uh, views about life and society, and their cultural differences are quite pronounced. This has a role to play in, in this emergence of this language. Secondly, social economic class, as we shall explain. At the very beginning, Shang has always been associated with the underclass, with the bottom part of the social economic pyramid, but now we are seeing some bit of differences. It's sort of rising out of the bottom, you know, rising towards the top. But again, uh, I won't dwell too much on this, but I think it's important to highlight uh, the character of Nairobi. Um, <clears throat> it has 10% of the total population of the country. It produces 60% of Kenya's G uh, GDP. That means most of the money made in Kenya is made in Nairobi. <laughs> and that means most of the economic activity takes place in Nairobi. And also subsequently, at least in terms of language and culture, it is an epicenter, you know, it is from where uh, 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 many, many trends begin and spread out. Now in terms of language, it is important to, 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 uh, to note that whatever ling language comes out of Nairobi, right, let's, let's talk about Swahili, right, you see a difference between Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam, as an epicenter of the Swahili, standard Swahili language in Tanzania, is, well, the, the, net, the habit inhabitants or the original people of Dar es Salaam are actually native Swahili speakers. So if Dar es Salaam is the epicenter, it tends to spread out good Swahili, so to speak, okay, more or less. Uh, Nairobi being an epicenter of another kind, and still exporting to the rest of the country, it sort of spreads, what it spreads in this case is actually Sheng. Not, not anything else. So this is important at the end of the, uh, the day. The point about uh, the, uh, the most of the people living uh, on only a very small part of the city, again, this is nothing unusual about uh, Nairobi. Many African cities are like that. But the, imp the, the implication is that a lot of people live in very crowded places. But more importantly, these days, they have begun to spread out with improved communications, better roads that are now leading out of the city, uh, better services, electricity, and so on and so forth, people are finding it much more convenient. Instead of living in a t tight little room in the city, spread out to the sort of service, middle income and low income areas. And I, shall, as I, I will argue that this spreading out of the uh, community, of the people out of the city, is also they are taking Sheng along with them to other parts of the country, to the rural areas and to other towns of the country. Also, the uh, rural urban linkages, as again with many African cities, they remain very strong. Okay? People you know, move back and forth from the village. When things are good, when there's a job in the city, you stay on for a while. If things get hard, you always have a little home in the village where you can go back and uh, regroup yourself, uh, your energies, or you know, uh, live in a different way. And then after that, you go back. Now, what happens uh, is that uh, if uh, people who have been living in the city 
they take certain habits to the, uh, with them to back to their rural bases, and that includes language as well. So we are seeing also Sheng in this way being uh, 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 taken away, uh, uh, to other parts of the, of the outside of Nairobi. So I mean, this is just uh, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. So um, this would the yellow part would be the city itself, the city of Nairobi, and Sheng would have been the, started somewhere there, all right. But now, this metropolitan area is where most Kenyans are now <coughs> spreading. So in actual fact, those four million people we are talking about, probably most of them are actually maybe in this, in this other area. And now this is becoming included as part of the Nairobi City metropolitan area, which I think even at the time I was writing, we were writing 10, 15 years ago, you know, it was still, Nairobi was still considered to be just the yellow part. Right, um, quickly about language in Kenya, the domains of use, uh, we find English, as you can see, is, many, <coughs> is the main language for news and media, international business, education, higher levels of government. That means, uh, uh, yes, you know, most of the parliamentary debates and, uh, you know, other policy uh, meetings and uh, so on and so forth are held in English. But when the politician government goes down to the rural communities, they're more likely to use Swahili or the, or the local vernacular. So Swahili for uh, so-called lower level commercial activity, I mean day to day, you know, commercial trade and so forth, social interaction, inter-ethnic communication, on the radio of course, uh, and so but more imp very importantly, uh, 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 to express nationalism and solidarity. Now Sheng has entered into most of these domains today, right? As I shall demonstrate shortly, it is now uh, uh, Sheng, or this variety of Kenyan, Swah uh, Kenyan Swahili, uh, has entered all these other domains that were restricted, you know, very strictly to <coughs> English and Kiswahili. And so, generally, this whole change and increasing use of Sheng, I think, is a fascinating phenomenon with regard to uh, the phenomenon of linguistic uh, contact and change, innovation and so forth, but more so within a specific urban African context. Uh, an offshoot of uh, Sheng uh, is Eng, okay, uh, <laughs> uh, who uh, again Abdulaziz and Osinda, who wrote the second article on Sheng, right? They had a little entry there about Eng, uh, which they argued was a counterpart to these low, uh, these other code associated with the lower, the lower classes. So the upper classes decided to bring out their own little, you know, uh, another code, more prestigious much more based on English, but still involving a lot of con code mixing. We can, I'll come back to that later <laughs> in a while. Right, so as I said before, the extreme registers of Sheng have always been associated or maybe still linked to the underworld, criminal, youthful, prohibited, but not necessarily illegal activities. For example, uh, the, the Matatu industry, which is the minibus, the transport industry, is, very, very, is a vibrant uh, industry in Kenya. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of minibuses that transport people back and forth all over throughout the country. The dominant language that is used by these fairly uh, 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 interesting characters is Sheng mainly. So there's a bit of association with uh, you know, uh, that uh, <coughs> part. However, these registers are becoming a minority spaces. Now, 10, 10, 15 years ago, it would have been very difficult to hear a, you know, a, a public figure actually even daring to, to, to speak in uh, anything about Sheng or in Sheng. And, and but now, not too long ago, we have even the U.S. President speaking Sheng. I'll show you in a minute. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, please, everybody have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jambo. Thank you so much. A standard for Haiti Jumbo. For your timely remarks, your warm welcome, uh, and the great work that has gone into hosting this summit. It is wonderful to be back in Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of 
honored to be the first U.S. president to visit Kenya. Um, and obviously this is personal for me. Uh, there's a reason why my name is Barack Hussein Obama. Okay. Okay. We know the reason why. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, this, the, 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 the interesting thing is that he started out with standard uh, Swahili hujambo. Every, a lot of people here know how to say hujambo, sijambo. And then he paused for a while and decided he has to make some kind of impact. And he goes, niaje wase. Now, this is archetypical uh, a shang, right? Prototypical shang, okay? Which many uh, uh, people would associate with very young people uh, of a certain social class or ethnicity, so to speak, okay? It is a sort of equivalent of saying, yo, what's up, guys? Yeah? <laughs> and this is what Obama said. Now, he must have some advisor who was clearly uh, attuned to the trends, the linguistic trends, and decided to, to use that. But I, I use that um, to simply make the point that Sheng has the accept acceptability of this youth code, of this underclass uh, ori with, original, with origins in the underclass has become almost mainstream. Now, he's not the only one. We shall see that uh, there are other politicians who have also engaged in that, who have uh, used Sheng. Um, so what I think is that this expansion of the, of the domains of use of Sheng, right, call up, you know, require some investigation. Right? We need to find out what is going, what is going on and more importantly, as, uh, what is going to happen. Uh, this point is important about Sheng uh, <coughs> and others like it, like the Nush spoken in Abidjan and come from Anglais. You will notice that Sheng did not arise out of the need, of a need. There was no communicative need. We have Swahili. Swahili is perfectly well suited for inter-ethnic communication and even international communication, of course. But still, the need or, or the arising of this uh, under additional code raises important questions about uh, uh, language, whether about, you know, if language is simply a means of communication, we know that it's not only that, but how do these codes arise and why are they coming up? So, I'm working on the hypothesis that uh, this original character of Sheng has changed as an in-group covered with <coughs> language is changing to a to that of an urban code of wider communication, an urban vernacular, okay? And it firmly belongs to the continuum of code that Nairobians and Kenyans in general navigate through, which is characterized by extensive code mixing, which I have coined this term Kenyanese. Uh, <coughs> I'm not sure if it's gonna stick, but that's what I think, because I shall, I'll explain uh, shortly. I will not go too much in that, but again, it's important to point out on average, Nairobians and many Kenyans speak an average of three languages. Few people don't speak three languages. Most people speak at least two, uh, at, at, at least two, but probably most uh, speak three. At least the research I did way back, uh, <clears throat> I found that about uh, uh, close to 90% of the respondents, okay, of about 1,200 respondents, uh, claimed to speak three languages. But I'm not the only one. Others have also done the same. Now, there has been a bit of discussion, again, Abdullah Aziz and Sindhi, they have argued that it's a kind of triglossia, but I find that does not quite um, tally with the, what Ferguson proposed way back in 1959. And I think uh, somebody else, who, Snow, who was looking at um, uh, other situations in, in, uh, in Asia, I think it describes a bit better modern diglossia, where um, you have, a, rather than a high variety and a low variety, you have a, the use of a standard variety being the sort of the equivalent to the high. And the low L varieties would be more about, would be the, 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 the vernaculars or the other codes, the non-standard varieties that are used within the, the situation. In this case, I include Sheng there. So this, uh, this is because um, we're not talking of a situation where only w the one language is used for exclusively for certain, let's say, religious purposes or others, no. Uh, 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 English in Kenya is used for all kinds of purposes. Swahili standard Swahili is used for all kinds of different varieties of purposes. So it is not exclusive to the other non-standard varieties. So and again, a very small number of Kenyans have high competence in the standard varieties, whether it's English or Kiswahili. OK? 
Okay? And therefore, um, the low varieties of Swahili, well, I'm calling them low varieties, meaning the non-standard varieties, including Sheng, all right? Okay? As well as the, uh, the, the, the vernacular, that is the Kenyan African languages, are the most widely used codes in Nairobi. In other words, very few people around Nairobi go around work is talking, you know, a, a proper standard English or Swahili. Therefore, code mixing is extensive and results in this, what I'm calling uh, Kenyanese, to describe a variety of ways um, uh, uh, of, 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 speak, of, of, uh, disc of uh, describing Kenyan Swahili, Kenyan English, Shang, Angsh, all those things. To me, they're just simply uh, uh, varieties that exist along a continuum. And most Kenyans are perfectly able to navigate back and forth depending on the situation now. Uh, factors that are, uh, that are uh, available. Right, again, we know all this, that um, language mixing, um, uh, uh, language uh, contact results in these things of borrowing, calculating, code switching, and so forth. I'll give a few examples, so on. And I think I'll focus more a bit on, on, on code switching or, or code mixing in general, um, because I think it's, you know, I think it, it's more interesting in terms of uh, linguistic theory, particularly from a socio-psychological perspective. I like this uh, view by Taff of uh, code switching or code mixing, language mixing as a strategy of neutrality. Because I find there is a reason why people who are perfectly capable of speaking standard English or perfectly capable of speaking standard Swahili choose not to. Right? Okay, there are situations which require, it seems to establish some kind of solidarity, some kind of rapport, which is expressed in terms of language and otherwise would not be. So I'm trying to think, uh, believe that um, this, uh, this extensive court mixing is, is motivated by these psychological factors. And in the case of Kenya, I think they are quite relevant, um, where ethnic nationalism is high, where there's a lot of disparities, socioeconomic disparities. People have to find a way of speaking to each other in a polite way, in a nice way, without offending one another, by using codes that are identified with you know, any of these particular groups. I won't go too much into that detail because you know about code mixing and you know about uh, the metrics uh, language framework of, uh, of Maya Scotton, which you know, has its issues but has been used uh, to explain many situations. And I adopt it more because uh, it was developed out of the Kenyan situation because her studies were based on studies in, Nairobi and in Kenya, various parts of the country. However, what is important is that um, this idea of the matrix language, I think, is important uh, because um, basically uh, um, uh, uh, she argues that um, <clears throat> in code mixing situations, there is always the basic language, the language in which things are embedded from, you know, borrowed from another language. And so if we take this perspective, uh, it might be easy to explain Sheng versus Angsh so that you have the matrix in Sheng is Swahili, and the matrix in, Eng in, in Engsh is English, so that you're bringing in other uh, material, but just by switching back and forth uh, uh, the matrix. Um, right, also the languages of Kenya, that's also important, other vernaculars, Kenyan African languages, can also act as matrix. All right, because sometimes people are using their own, uh, one, one, one of the Kenyan languages, but they're bringing in English, Swahili, and possibly other languages. So basically, uh, extensive code mixing is the norm, and all forms of discourse, public and private, and even informal registers. Uh, just an example, again, um, um, he's a, a pastor, uh, but you can see the part in, in red, all right? <coughs> They are either English or they are, uh, they are English or Swahili, right? Uh, the, sorry, um, one of them is uh, sorry. Oops. Okay, <laughs> uh, maybe you should listen to that one first, although you may not understand. Oops. That's not working. I'm not sure if it's going to work. It will come better in a minute. Anyone conversing with Swahili here? If not, maybe then it's not very important. But you might, if the volume. Ah. 
Just listen. Okay, this young lady here is, exp uh, is describing a, her, you know, very difficult past, okay? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and what she's doing is she's just like this pastor here who is also uh, be, uh, I'm interviewing. Uh, the, the code mixing is ubiquitous, right? Whether the matrix is Swahili or English. And the point I'm trying to make here simply is that in Kenya, right, or in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, Nairobi, right, uh, very few people do not code mix. And I'm going to shortly argue the implication of this upon what we call Sheng. Um, this is, these are examples of, uh, let me go back to, yeah, an example of uh, the kind of uh, code switching. And by the way, uh, uh, some people such as Bokamba make a distinction between code mixing and code switching. Um, uh, code switching referring to you know, in, uh, changing languages or this, uh, uh, um, uh, um, yes, complete you know, switching from one language to another, full units of the language, whereas mixing can bring in unbound morphemes and you know, fix them up into the language or the matrix that is being talked about. So that distinction, I won't dwell too much on it because at the end of the day, we are talking about the mixing of two codes. But you can see here with a translation, uh, in Ensh, what might be regarded as Ensh, I never buy anything hapatao. Yeah, this is somebody from the upper class part of Nairobi. Yeah. A Sheng speaker would say, ah, mimi sinunuangi kitu hapatao. Now, <laughs> uh, if you know a bit of Swahili, <coughs> you'll find that uh, you will understand what he means or what this uh, uh, phrase here, all right, this uh, particular one is, uh, is, is a negative, but it's using a, you know, a non-standard uh, a habitual form, okay, in the negative. And I'll come back to that again to explain a bit more later. Um, this one here, Kwanin Rantaka Mtoto at the age of 20. Okay, again, that's a very normal kind of uh, sentence which I've elicited in, in, uh, uh, with people, okay. Why do you want a baby at the age of 20? Okay? So at the age of 20 comes in into a Swahili matrix very naturally and nobody bats <coughs> an eyelid and goes on. Now, whether this is what you're calling Sheng or Kenyan Swahili, that's one of the questions that we want to raise. Um, another one here, that's the same girl here I was interviewing. So she says, um, because both code switching and code mixing can happen you know, in the same speech event. So, nilimwambia ni nabol, ni nabol ya pili, akanza kunipiga. Na mini kadisa inaiza run away. So I told him, this is a very shame, you know, way of saying uh, being pregnant. I'm pregnant for the second time. He started beating me, so then I decided to run away. Nika decide, okay? So that's clearly called, called mixing, you know. Decide is being inserted straight into a, 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 a verb, you know, Swahili verb phrase. Uh, this other sample here, I picked this up actually from a radio talk show. Again, I think some of the live calling talk shows are quite credible sources of you know, natural data. And you have this uh, host, who was a perfectly, you know, native Swahili speaker from the coast, saying, Mwambia uyu ndugu, the beautiful ones are not yet born. And then immediately, she translates, she translated that phrase in bold, okay? And again, back to Puff and other scholars of the, of the phenomenon, they argue that this type of uh, uh, hedges or, uh, you know, translating exactly what you've said indicate an awareness that one is code mixing. And this is what makes a difference between plain borrowing and code mixing. So a lot of stuff that we find in, in, the, in the spoken language is actually people are conscious of it. Okay? They are aware that they're actually switching the language. Okay. Um, as opposed to this sentence, for example, in sample five, many, many speakers, Kenyans or Tanzanians, would not really realize that they are using English, okay, and Arabic in that sentence. Musa hunyo kahawa hotelini kila wiki. So the items in bold <laughs> are loans from Arabic and from English. But how many Kenyans know that that is the case? They might guess about hoteli, sounds a bit familiar, right? 
Uh, but many, most people, I bet, do not realize Kahawa, you know, where, where that comes from, all right? And many even don't realize Wiki is an English, you know, loan from Wik. So this uh, 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 an awareness, right, is what distinguishes uh, uh, loans or borrowed word, you know, words from, yeah. However, in the next one, you know, this sentence here, clearly, this person would have to know some English. Imagine in Toyuaku, Tafilaje. By the way, well, I should highlight this feel. This is feel, English feel. Yeah? Imagine it's your child. How would you feel? Okay? So this person clearly is not, you know, using loans or borrowed words. You know, this perfectly, well, you know, maybe not so perfectly, but conscious that they're using two uh, different uh, uh, grammars. So, with those few examples, one of the questions that arises is, now, when we glorify and say, okay, Sheng is a, you know, youth, is a social dialect, of, is a, one of the dialects of Swahili, is a social dialect of Swahili, uh, what, cons what makes that uh, real? Is it the case that the ordinary spoken language of many Nairobians, okay, is actually a form of Sheng, because Sheng is characterized mainly by code switching, although there are a few other things that I will indicate. But those other things, including phonological changes or f features that have come, crept into Swahili from Sheng, are now being adopted by mainstream. And this is where uh, we have, uh, uh, have <clears throat> I want to raise a point. So the next few things I'm going to highlight right, are what you might say call non-standard features of Kenyan Swahili, right? Or what would be the features of Kenyan Swahili, okay? Now the question is, is this what is being referred to as Sheng? <coughs> so, for example, rule extension over generalization is very, quite common. And this is just one example which Obama used. If only he knew how, you know, he, had, he has murdered the language, he would be probably not very <laughs> keen, right? So, Hamjambo, um, the, in Swahili, standard Swahili, this M marks, or rather, rather the underlying part of it, all of it, all of it indicates the second person plural, okay, already in itself. It does encode that information. Um, the, this suffix is used in other situations, not in this uh, where you've already marked in the, uh, uh, um, uh, the person already, okay? In imperatives, okay, then you can use the ni, right, to mark the difference between singular you and singular plural, okay? So you come here, njo hapa, but you all come here, njo Because Swahili, uh, unlike English, but like many other uh, Bantu languages, it makes a distinction between uh, singular you and plural you. So what happens with uh, Kenyan speakers or, or non-stand non -stand speakers is that they take this rule where it doesn't belong, right? And so you have this very common phrase which I hear all the time with public speakers, with <laughs> politicians, and they greet people, Hamjamboni, which is not, you know, it's, it's really overgeneralizing that rule of the use of the suffix ni. Um, morphology as well, right? You have these, these are ordinary verbs, right? So for example, kuangalesha comes from the verb ongea, to speak, okay? But there is no such derivation as ongelesha, which this person is trying to mean to talk, to make somebody talk. Actually, in Kenyan uh, speech, it is used to, to mean talking to somebody, okay? Right? But in standard Swahili, that's, that's not unacceptable. So it's another example of overgeneralizing that. A lot of simplified morphology, that's, uh, you know, quite common um, to the extent that, you know, some people, had, you know, would think, would propose, uh, would have proposed that some of the Swahili spoken in, uh, in parts of Kenya is pigeon-like or is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is too simplified. But again, uh, you will notice that this is spoken and said by many people who could otherwise speak, you know, proper Swahili, including myself, you know, when I'm in the right situation. So there has to be other explanations, not just the uh, paucity of grammar. Freestanding words instead of in fixation. This is very common, in, again, in Kenyan Swahili, um, rather than in fixation, which, should be, uh, which is more common in standard. 
Um, this common one, the uh, grammatical, the habitual tense, this is now becoming in Kenyan Swahili, uh, reverting from its old Bantu origins, right? Um, uh, which had sort of disappeared along the history of Swahili for some reason, maybe from influence from Arabic and other languages. But now it's making a comeback to where it belongs, sort of. You know? And it comes back in Kenyan Swahili in the sense that uh, uh, perhaps because many other Bantu languages have this aga. Actually, it's aga, all right, the habitual suffix. But Swahili uses who, uh, um, a prefix to describe something you do habitually. I come to school every day. Mimi huja shule ni kila siku. But in this, in Kenyan Swahili or Sheng, you hear mimi hukujaga. Uh, but beyond aga, it has also, uh, have noted uh, in my interviews that, um, and in, you know, in my observations, uh, the pre-nasalization of that, uh, of that uh, there is now almost standard. So most people will not simply say mimi hukujaga, but mimi hukujanga. So again, that's uh, very typical of that. Um, changes such as weakening of, of, of sounds, right? So again, in Shang, Kenyan Swahili, stroke Kenyan Swahili, most of the time you hear people say naeza instead of naweza. Naweza becomes naeza, siwezi, siezi, and so forth. Okay? So it's very, very common as well. Syllable structure, definitely. And that's what makes Shang sound so we different and weird. Okay? Lots of long open syllables for some reason, <coughs> at least at the end, yeah? for some reason. So Ocha becomes Ocha, Mtoi becomes Mtoi, Odijo becomes Odijo, becomes Odijo and so forth. There's always this sort of uh, additional weight of the syllables at the end of, of words. Obviously, the, the lexical innovations are the most. Okay? They are all over the place. Okay. And these are some of the things that make uh, you know, uh, uh, Kenyan Swahili uh, distinctive. Now, these ones I have <laughs> included here, they are, they are actually from what is considered Sheng. So again, 10, 15 years ago, this would not have been heard even in non-standard Kenyan Swahili. Okay? So now the, the, the boundary between the two is quite blurry, in my view. Because now all these, you'll hear them in very ordinary Swahili, Kenyan Swahili, in formal and <coughs> informal registers to an extent. Okay, not all the time, but you know, to an extent. And without, uh, uh, without um, uh, fear of uh, being, you know, speaking the wrong version of the language. Um, a lot of non-Arabic, non-English loanwords. That's what another observation in Kenyan Swahili. Okay. So, as we all know, the history of uh, Kiswahili is filled with loans. Some people estimate up to 40% in certain you know, registers, maybe, uh, from Arabic. And then, of course, English uh, in the last you know, 70 to 100 years has also contributed a lot. But now, more recently, I notice, you know, Kenyan languages, particularly Kikuyu, uh, or what we call Kikuyu, right? and for good reason, because uh, uh, this area, uh, Nairobi, is situated you know, in both Kikuyu and Maasai-speaking uh, people's country. And so there's a greater population, perhaps, and therefore more influence of that. But all these words, Shosho. So grandmother, Shosho, in, 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 uh, in Kikuyu, has taken hold totally. Most Kenyans now are talking about, oh, Nainda Kumona Show Show. I'm going to see my Show Show. All right? All right? That's actually Kikuyu. Okay. Okay. Uh, there are two words in Swahili Bibi, which is used in the southern dialects uh, in Tanzania mainly, and Nyanya, which is used in standard Kenyan Swahili. All right? But Kenyans have rejected both <laughs> okay, and borrowed another word from the, the language in contact. And this is what I talked about, and I think it's a very interesting uh, things happening here about what happens in these you know, contact situations. Um, right, so there are many, and I have a whole section later on somewhere, not, not today, but uh, because it's too, too much, about all these Gekui loans, because I, you know, as I did the, re I did the research, I realized there are many, many, many more. 
much more in proportion than any of the, of the other languages. Of course, there are other, la you know, in, uh, uh, loans from other languages. And I've said there's a lot of influence because of the proximity. Um, yeah, many, these are more examples of, uh, from Gikuyu, which are ubiquitous in Kenyan Swahili. <coughs> the grammar as well, you know, you have, so, things like Nitakam Kesho, you'll hear it, uh, even from lecturers and other people. Okay. So this, I'll come tomorrow, this is from English, Nitakam Kesho. Again, a few years back, we would have seen pretty badly, you know, it's, that's, you know, that's, call it ghetto language, right? youth language, you know, underclass language, uh, uh, unemployed youth, you know, criminal language, right? But now uh, it, it's all over, yeah? Nitakam Kesho, yeah? Or actually, CSI, this is, I find very interesting because this, this, this one you can see, there's just a mix of, you know, a, one verb from English into Swahili. But here now, um, uh, even a native speaker might, of Swahili might have trouble understanding that. Yeah? Because Ishia is not a standard word to mean to, to go. Okay, it, it comes to end, it means to end, actually. With a, you know, it's preposition of form, probably means end towards or something like that, okay. But now, this has become the very most common word, ubiquitous word to mean go, mean I shia. This, quite amazing, right? I've, I've uh, at, you know, recorded this, I've tested this, you know, uh, very radical changes of grammar, because Swahili does not allow multiple uh, uh, objects. Uh, other languages do. And in Kenyan Swahili, you'll find that, you know, this, not quite, not acceptable, but it is, uh, it, it can be heard. So my view is that some of these innovations and changes through contact influence may become permanent features of Kenyan Swahili. Okay, and so again, if we do another 10 years from now here, we, we want to see what's, what, what's going to be the situation like. So very quickly to demonstrate how um, uh, Sheng is entering so-called mainstream domains. I'll just go very quickly through a few examples of that. At work, this is something I, I overheard not too long ago. Right? You know, I'm just standing in the line and uh, I'm listening to the bank clerk, you know, the tellers, you know, and this is what I heard. I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is, it's not, it's not, it's not Swahili, it's not good Swahili, it's not good English either, okay? And this is an upmarket bank. It, oh, sorry, this is a bank in an upmarket neighborhood where you expect people to be very proper, you know, more or less, okay? But the bank tellers, you know, between themselves, you know, I could overhear. They are speaking what people call Sheng. And again, this is why I'm questioning whether it is Sheng or is just how, is that how Kenyans speak, maybe? Nipe, 120K. 120K means 120, 120,000 shillings. So, you know, all that information you wouldn't know if you, yeah, you'd have to fill in, you know, because it's really heavily coded. Eh, ukona do? Do, from do, English, money, pesos, <laughs> uh, okay? Yeah, so it's a very common uh, 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 Sheng word. You know, again, 15, 20 years ago, these are very old one, by the way. It was way back in the 70s, maybe back from the colonial times, do, right? But up until recently, it was totally unacceptable in anywhere mainstream speech situation. You know, it's, it's for the youth down there, right? Do, all right? But now, it's in the bank. They're talking about do, <laughs> okay? Uh, in schools, again, this is another whole topic. I have another whole chapter on this because um, the Sheng, number one, Sheng plays a very important role in the daily lives of young people in Kenya, as with all other uh, people, because group reference, you know, uh, uh, so-called peer pressure is, is really, really uh, important. So young people want to speak you know, like others, you know, they don't want to be left out. And so Sheng is principal in that, is fundamental in terms of being accepted as a youth in the right crowd of people. Now, number two, many Kenyan youth first come into close contact with each other during a formative period of life, in high school, I should say, and that's where they expand their personal and social linguistic networks, okay? Remember again, especially people from rural areas, they may never have left their village, you know, or their community, you know, throughout their life until they get into high school at a very critical time in their lives, when they are 13, 14, 15. Suddenly, especially boarding schools, very important because now it's a microcosm, again, of Nairobi because, again, the two things, 
Boarding schools are more prestigious because they cost more, right? So, you know, if you go to a boarding school, you're expected you're, you know, sort of in better uh, social economic uh, position. Number two, uh, they receive people from all over the country and more so from Nairobi. Okay, so that's why I say the boarding schools of Kenya tend to be really reflective of the larger uh, nation. And so once the kids join that school, you know, they go into the school, the first thing they do is to pick up shame, which has been brought by the even more prestigious uh, peers who come from the city, the urban-based cities, boys and girls. What happens during the holidays? These little fellows from the rural communities, they go back to their villages, our communities, and now I'm walking around in the community where I was born myself, not far from Nairobi, and I hear Sheng all over the place. The young boys, they don't even want to speak Kikuyu. They don't even want to be heard speaking Kikuyu. Okay, it's too unprestigious. Okay? Sheng is what matters. And as I did a little short study, that's what I found out in, the, in a, one of the local secondary schools. Uh, uh, about, it's about 60 kilometers, from, uh, 50 kilometers from Nairobi. Just beyond that metropolitan region, maybe I should show you that so that you can get an idea. Uh, um, uh, here. So that <coughs> school is somewhere here, all right? Just on the edge of what is officially the, 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 the metropolitan Nairobi area. So you just like, but it's about, you know, this is about, uh, you know, 40, 50 kilometers, okay? With a new superhighway now, no big deal. You know, you'll be there in an hour or less, okay? Uh, uh, whether it's driving or by public transport. Now, um, so what I, I went to this school, which is, you know, right in the heartland of uh, Kikuyu speaking community, and this is what I found. If you look at the Sheng column, suddenly nobody claimed Sheng as a first language. A few say claimed, you know, one or two, I think this, the total was uh, 235 students that I, in, uh, that I had fill out questionnaire. But if you notice that their street language, what I call their street language, i.e. the language that they, 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 I asked them what language do you speak when you're out there with the boys? Uh, at the pool bar, they like pool, pool to play pool, or to watch videos, or to watch football in a local uh, a pool in the local shopping center. And they say Shang, of course. And I popped in, you know, a couple of occasions, and of course they could hear, you know, a mix of that. But you know, they, you could hear a lot of Shang going on for solidarity again, you know, to to talk with each other. Twenty-eight <coughs> percent using that, okay, for solidarity more than their first language. <coughs> so Shang in a rural community is more important, more used by the young boys and girls, you know, more than their own mother tongue. Okay, and this is a fairly homogeneous, you know, linguistically speaking, Kikuyu speaking community. You have no reason not to get along with anyone if you speak Kikuyu. But you can see uh, that I, I found that was very, uh, quite interesting. Obviously in school, uh, they're not allowed, they're, they're discouraged from speaking that. And that's why you can see a very small report, you know, of both the mother tongue and the Shang because maybe they wouldn't even tell me if they did because they are afraid that you know they might be uh, yeah. But um, I thought it's quite interesting because uh, um, just you know just by observation I had seen you know there's a change going on, there's tremendous change actually. And uh, this uh, study, short study uh, revealed uh, showed that. In politics, lots of it. I'll just say very briefly, Unborgabo is a song that came out in 2002 precisely the first multi-party election after 24 years of having one you know, person and therefore there was a lot of excitement of getting a new, a new leadership and so forth. And the person who won the presidency, uh, Moiki Baki, they adopted this song. Genge, Genge is, uh, is Kenyan hip hop. That's the name they use for Kenyan hip hop. It's basically the hip hop you all know about, you, you know, US based, but in Swahili or in Sheng, I should say, for in that matter. Now, Unbogable is not, sp strictly speaking, is not Sheng, but it is reflective of that coinage that goes on all the time in Sheng and in Kenyan language. An is actually the English prefix, you know, negative, not doable. And then the abel yeah, is the, the suffix, the usual uh, suffix of English of saying ability to do something. Boga is the only, uh, uh, is, is a luo, the luo, one of the Kenyan's main languages, all right? It is a, a, a Luo verb meaning beat, you know, or conquer. So you can guess, and means 
what is unworkable, unbeatable, all right? And it was so, you know, very, uh, 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 you know, bragging and so forth, and, and you know, it, it appealed to those politicians, and they adopted it as sort of an anthem. So in their political rallies and so forth, they used that song, and guess what? They won the presidency. <laughs> okay, so, you know, uh, and that's, at least in my view, in my observation, this is when the ears began to prick among Kenyans. Hey, wait a minute, you mean a serious old man like Mwai Kibaki can actually adopt a Sheng, you know, sort of Shengish, you know, youthful uh, beat and word and actually win the presidency? And then he went on to use a few other, you know, Sheng words during his speeches, which would have everybody roaring with laughter. So I think uh, from around then, you know, there's a bit of an opening. So you can see language is very much linked to uh, local politics and dynamics. The next one was uh, to now is Mick. <laughs> this is also another presidential candidate um, um, who last election in 20, yeah, that was 2012, yeah? To now is Mick. Again, the, the verb here is make in, in English, make. Uh, Wes is actually weza, it should be weza in Swahili, weza, able to, can, okay? And then the tuna is simply the subject marker for the uh, uh, first person plural and the present tense. So we can make it. That's what it means, this, this thing, yeah? Tuna we make. We can make it, yeah? Genius. And, you know, he had T-shirts and everything printed. That was his slogan, you know, everywhere, you know, you know oh, tuna we make, tuna we make. Unfortunately, he didn't. He actually came last. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't always work with the... With the, with the <laughs> With that, yeah, and then of course we had um, uh, uh, President Obama only a few months ago when he visited Kenya, also getting that. The reason I bring this up is to demonstrate that you know, sort of, I mean, you know, I, I'd like to believe it's not just um, you know um, playing games with the youth. It, it's possible, you know, considering that you know, uh, by the latest count, you know, 62 percent of the Kenyan population is under 35 years old. So if you're a clever politician, obviously you want to get their votes, you know, some, for some reason. But I think it's beyond that. I think there is a, a, a way in which Sheng is redefining the cultural identity of Kenya. Right? It is reflecting some kind of modernity. It is the one that is showing, yes, we are, you know, we're new, as, as we shall see. You go on the internet, you'll find these things. You go on the media. I just did, uh, uh, you know, I looked, uh, at uh, different um, media platforms, and uh, I may have missed one or two, I don't think, but um, all these, you know, outlets, they actually broadcast Sheng, in Sheng, in various ways, whether it's a full news program or, you know, other shows, yeah, including the national TV, which is the KBC, right? Sheng is not discouraged. In fact, when I listen to the call-in shows and I listen to the people doing interviews, it's amazing. They might condemn somebody for speaking Sheng, but that's what they're actually speaking themselves. So it's very interesting that um, uh, uh, the, the, the disconnect between the actual linguistic performance and the perception you know, by the individual. So online, you have you know, lots of social media groups and email chat groups and uh, a whole website. There's one website dedicated to Sheng, right, which is a group of young people in Nairobi who have taken it as a project and have actually uh, done quite well, winning you know grants from the Ford Foundation and so forth to promote whatever it is um, um, that they're doing. But they're using Sheng as their language of, of doing that. Newspapers, you have the Daily Nation. Some of these national newspapers actually have dedicated pages, you know, in Sheng or Kenya Swahili, whatever you want to call it. The Nairobian is very interesting. As I said, Nairobi being the epicenter of all these, <coughs> it is, there is a, uh, is a weekly, I think, uh, newspaper. But they have editorials and news every week in Sheng, which I find quite interesting, such as this one. Um, I, mean, I mean, too detailed, but it's, it's, it's typical of how a young, youthful Kenya would speak. But this then has been translated onto print on a national newspaper, and it is actually acceptable. So this is what I mean by, um, um, you know, a, a clear change in the evaluation of Sheng uh, in Kenya today. So it's just about, you know, teacher strikes and uh, the teachers beating children too much and so forth. And uh, yeah, so most of it, is the, the matrix is obviously Swahili here, but the liberal throwing in, in uh, uh, even less than others.
online, as I've said, GoSheng is a whole website dedicated to, to that language. Um, and this is one of the articles I pulled in from, from that website. Yeah. It's about Jeremy Clarkson, when he, got fired, when he lost his job or got fired, whatever you want to do. So the question is, will Jeremy Clarkson move on to Netflix? Has he? I'm not sure if he has. Yeah. But there was, I think there was, you know, he was being headhunted for that. And, and look, the words I've put in bold are all, you know, Sheng, actually now proper Sheng, words that may, uh, in this particular register, may not be easily understood by non-Sheng speaking people. The underlined ones, they can be deciphered. For example, Kustri Mamuvi. What is that? Anyone can guess? Uh, no. what, oops. What is this? Kustri Mamuvi. Streaming, <laughs> Streaming movies, right? Yeah. Uh, yep, um, well, full control, progi, it's program, yeah, telly, <laughs> that's not too hard. Um, right, so you have English, you have Sheng, and a Swahili matrix, yeah, and very carefully edited, that's what I noticed, you know, they are very careful because I think they want to set standards of some kind, basically standardize Sheng, okay. And they seem to be quite, quite serious because, well, <laughs> I shouldn't say that because uh, maybe you can go on the website, but most of the, a lot of stuff they just cull it from a lot of newspapers around the world, especially uh, tabloids. Yeah? <laughs> so, uh, but still, I think it's very interesting because they address issues that relate to modern things, modernity, <coughs> right? Because this is not stuff your ordinary over 35 year old Kenyan would be, well, over 40 years old would be even aware of about Jeremy Clarkson and so on and so, so forth. But Kenyan youth, Nairobi youth, they're very keyed in you know, <coughs> international. So I also see uh, the transnational um, aspect of this code and how the youth are using, or the Kenyans are using it to sort of identify themselves as upwardly mobile, modern, with international connections, okay? But they are not the upper class, rich, well to do, you see what I mean? Because that would have been the case. 10, 15, 20 years ago, English would be the one to project that identity. Now, there is a possibility of projecting the same, all right, using Sheng. And I think that's what I find very, very interesting because it's a turnaround in the language uses. Corporate advertising, lots of it. Even universities, you know, this, <laughs> yeah, they um, using a bit of Sheng, because, you know, digitize masomo. Uh, the ones in red are definitely, you know, Shang. In fact, you know, some people, some um, over 40s might object to using that, which means a girl, lady, right? Okay. Um, chapa is money, do. Now we've gone from do to chapa, okay? But this, as you can see, it's on a Barclays Bank advertisement. They recognize that. And I spoke to some of these people. Uh, uh, the, the, both the, 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 the Shang practitioners and, 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 and young people, as well as media um, advertising um, uh, people, and they say, well, they've done their research, and they know they can reach out more, and they pay handsomely to these people. So that's another dimension I won't get into, but there's a lot of uh, uh, economic output arising from that as well. Uh, that's, that's the advert I'm talking about. Get your money around the corner. That's actually, by the way, outside the University of Nairobi, just right there outside the University of the world. Right, I uh, wonder if, uh, the, I, again, I'm beginning to wonder, mainly because of this last point here. There's a group of people talking about, well, look, our education standards are falling, they're fall, they low, the kids are graduating, they're neither very competent in English, not in Swahili. Well, they, 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 although they're studying the two, but more importantly, the language of instruction, could it be the, you know, the vernacular or Sheng? If we allow for vernacular, why not Sheng? That's the question. So it brings in issues about constitutionality and whether people can actually make a case uh, for that. But I conclude by saying that um, <coughs> this increased use of Sheng in wider domains of language, uh, to me, contradicts popular understanding of it as a transient age-graded peer language of not much use away from the streets of inner city Nairobi. 
And the influence of Sheng is evident in adult registers, speech registers, and many different domains, which to me, again, reflect youth-led innovation and modernity. They're saying, look, we're going to lead the way using this language, not that stuffy old language we don't understand very well, either English or Swahili, standard, that is. But also, I think Sheng also served to fill the communicative gap created by wide variation in levels of competence. Again, it's a nice strategy of neutrality, if you want. You know? If you're not too good in this Swahili, English, and so forth, and you're speaking with someone who doesn't speak your mother tongue, you do a bit of you know, extensive code mixing, and you get along without losing any uh, 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 prestige. Um, and of course, the stigmatization of the vernacular, African Kenyan vernacular languages is also an important factor, I should have said. Because if you speak Sheng, you're modern, you are ethnically neutral, you're not confronting anybody. If you go around speaking Luo or Kikuyu in a group, in a place where others don't learn, you antagonize other people, you know, because they cannot understand. So Sheng actually serves an important function, okay? And it's not English, because again, now that looks to be you know, to, um, uh, it is restricted to certain domains, you know, formal domains. Mm -hmm. And then it's standard Swahili is, for many Kenyans, it's just too difficult. It's just too complicated. I won't get into all that trouble, you know. That's too, it, it, leave it to the from Mombasa people and the Tanzanians and all the others, you know. Yeah, yeah. So Sheng is a perfect, you know, compromise, you know, language, which, uh, <coughs> yeah. And yes, Sheng has broken its inner city frontiers to become an urban vernacular, I want to use this word, and uh, in the larger metropolitan region. Um, I also think it has, Sheng has added to this colorful spectrum of mixed codes, uh, which Kenyans use to navigate around the complex, stratified multilingual environment. Market forces have recognized the dynamism of language, I think, and uh, its role in society and contexts and so forth. Well, for school curricula, that's another whole topic and language policy. As I said, these questions are arising day by day. What do we do with these animals? They, I should show you some headlines, you know, all, you know, every other week. Shang is the demon, right? It is killing our education. It is destroying the eloquence of our children. No, 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 no. You know, everything is blamed on that. And nothing is blamed on the teachers who also cannot teach you know, the, the, uh, who cannot speak the language, you know, the, the language they use very well, because that's actually the real problem. Because the teachers who are insisting on people speaking, uh, not speaking Sheng, they themselves use Sheng unconsciously in class. So it's a very interesting thing, you know, the disconnect between what is and what is the perceptions. And I think that, uh, well, uh, to summarize, linguistic innovation is a natural phenomenon and as culture which is dynamic. And I think uh, that as Kenya becomes, you know, as time goes on, it is inevitable that Sheng is continuing to play an important role in some of those areas that I have described. And that's all I will have to say for now. Maybe there are a few questions to, to answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Hi, Monique. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, it's 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 fascinating because uh, while I was um, last year, I started looking at a new dialect of a mixture of English and French, which is spoken in New Brunswick, right? In Canada. Canada. Mm -hmm. And those people, and you know, like in Canada, you have, you know, some people, that are, most people are bilingual. You, right. know, you speak, you're completely fluent in English and in French. And in that province of New Brunswick, in the south of it, not even in the north, just in the south, since 1980, they speak a new language, mm -hmm. which they call Shiak. And it's exactly what you are describing. It's a real mixture of French and English. They keep the French structure and they put English words mm -hmm. and the morphology is from French. Mm -hmm. So they would conjugate the, the English verbs in as French. it was a French verb. Anyway, and it's exactly, you know, when you said I, 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 I could show you the headlines, you know, it's the devil, uh -huh. and what do we do in school? And <laughs> yeah. I mean, you open newspapers and they don't know what to do with Shia 
Because as you say, all of the, the, the younger, the young people, yeah. that's what they speak. Yes. It's exactly how you described it. But it's mm. a real, real, real mixture of French and English. And it's not that they start a sentence in French, they switch mm -hmm. to English, they go back to French. Not at all. It's, the, it's a mixture of English and French words. Mm -hmm. And they say that they are rules. So the kids learn Shiak and they know how to, and they don't make mistakes. I mean, I don't know the rules. To, yeah, I mean, I have to figure out what the rules are, I suppose. Do you know the rules of Shank? Uh, well, to me, the rules, are, as I said, is you know, if you look at, if you look at, if you approach it from a metrics point of view, right? Bas other than the borrowings, you know, the, in terms of the loan words, you know, the the the, the, the modifications that take place, I think it's really the, the grammar of Swahili, right? Yeah. Into which everything else, uh, you know, is is protein. So, it, that's that's the grammar I would talk about. Yeah. However, the, the the morphology of it, you know, uh, yeah. uh, of the words in particular, that it requires a bit more study. Yeah. yeah? Because I think there are patterns, and in particular, uh, uh, yes, not in particular, but when, for example, the, the words are borrowed from other Kenyan languages, it seems to me there is something interesting in terms of there might be, there should be some rules yeah. about how they come into Sheng, other than simply elongating the final syllable. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because you can, s I haven't done a full uh, categorization, but you will notice certain, uh, uh, let's say, nouns behaving slightly different from the verbs that have been borrowed you know, from the language. Yeah? Or descriptive words will have a bit different way of being incorporated into, into the language. Yeah. But that's very interesting. Uh, and, and, and I'm wondering, uh, are this, these people, they are fluent both, both in languages? Yeah, they are fluent, I mean, yes. Well, At one point, I thought that maybe it was the French speakers and maybe, the, because the French speakers, obviously in Canada, the French would be bilingual and the English wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So I thought that maybe the French would speak, would speak Shiak. But then I came across videos Shiak. where the, the speakers, if you ask me, I would say that natively, their English is better than the French. So it seems that it goes both ways. Both ways. The only difference I see there is that at this point here, I, I think in the case of Sheng, there's actually not so much competence in those two cores. I mean, right. there is there is competence, but maybe I, I, I I've always you know um, argued in favor of uh, the model that we have of code mixing, which is that one is competent in the two systems in order to be able to switch yes. back and forth. But yeah. now I'm beginning to think yeah. maybe there is an element of incompetence. You know, yeah. you know that leads to these. Just like any learner, you know, who is not fully converting the language they're learning, they'll throw in words from the language they know. Yeah. I think that also is, is part of it. So that would be a, bit of a little difference, I would say, between the Shiak and, and, yeah. and the Sheng. I'm going to be working on Shiak, so I'll be in touch with you. Ah, very good. Now okay. we can compare notes. Sure, definitely. That would be lovely, yeah. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes, Prof. Thanks for your... Um, Thank you. And these kind of emergent <coughs> um, urban vernaculars are turning up all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So-called multicultural London English, uh, you know, the French that um, Monique talked about. There's, mm -hmm. there's French in, in uh, Paris that's heavily influenced by Arabic. And so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but what's interesting here is a sort of ideology that somehow this has more status and, you know, push for recognition. You don't get that in the ah, <coughs> Absolutely. I was curious about mm. whether this has been exported to other centers where, where Kiswahili is spoken. In Mombasa? In Mombasa. Definitely, yes. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, that is a point I was trying to make in the very beginning, maybe <coughs> not very well. That in spite of the, uh, what you might say, uh, this non standard speech of, of Nairobi. It is actually still exerting influence to the, to the native speakers of themselves. So in Mombasa and Lamu, in my last visit, the youth are, you know, very few people will go around saying hujambo. Hmm? No, people will say mambo, boa, yeah. sasa, fit, which is, you know, is, you know, shine. Um, now, there is a very interesting paper coming up soon by somebody who has been working on, the, on that element of uh, looking at the, the, the use of sheng outside of Nairobi. Uh, but to answer your question directly, yes, Sheng is spread all over. And it has to do with the prestige of the Nairobi, of the, of the capital. I think, you know, this is important because many people, most Kenyans look up to 
Nairobi for their, you know, or, or kind of model. The point about, um, you know, this uh, uh, presumably in, uh, 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 lower status code gaining, you know, overturning the table, I think that's where the important thing is in Kenya, at least. And it has to do with the demographics as well. Because now, I think in Kenya, even though the, the younger generation, you know, I mean 35 under, you know, I think that's, when I ask people who speak Sheng, they say, all the, everybody told me, oh, anybody who is under 35 years old, they speak Sheng. And eventually I came to realize there's a bit of, you know, there's a bit of truth in that, at least at the time. But the numbers are so many, uh, they, they are becoming a lot more sophisticated than their elders, so to speak, okay? Uh, the world trends are in their favor, all right? Uh, uh, fa international fashions, music, you know, of course, you know, because hip hop, as we said earlier, is so ubiquitous. But now it's being sung in the local languages. It's obviously, Sheng in Dar es Salaam, Bongo flavor, they call it, and it's also used in, you know, you, they use Kiswahili of Dar es Salaam, what they call Kiswahili Chamta, right? They don't quite, they don't quite have a Sheng, but they call it uh, uh, something slightly different. And I think this is playing a role in, 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 in giving prestige to this urban code right, uh, of the youth uh, because it can do more, actually. And as I said, it, is, it can help you attain th things that previously you couldn't. Economically, that's what I mean. The, the, the rappers in Sheng are making a lot of money. They drive around, in, you know, just like all rappers around the world. They, are, you know, they have lots of money by Kenyan standards, anyway. Okay, this um, very enterprising young people who have a website, Go Sheng, right? As I said, they get funding from Ford Foundation, from various international organizations to do whatever. That is a source of income. Okay, they are happy to do that, and so. Uh, they have realized that there is a commercial, uh, there is an, there is a, an element of, that can assist them with this language that only a decade ago was seen as belonging to that of the earth. And I think this is, what is, this is what politicians are very good to seize the moment, you know, to see the trends. And I think that's what they're doing as well. They say, oh, oh, wait a minute, and, you know, we better join the bandwagon. You know, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. Yes, Roseanne. What about <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yes. Sort of widespread, widespread, I guess? Yes, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, social economic classes, the upper classes, you know, upper middle class uh, mm -hmm. classes. Um, so Nairobi is basically divided into sort of two, you know, east and west. Okay, and uh, uh, the Eastland, we actually it's called Eastland, is where Sheng originates. It's the poor section of the of the of the of the city, low income to to, to very low income. The Westlands is the upper class, upper middle class, and very upper, uh, very upper classes. It's a very colonial city, basically. So that's how the city was divided in colonial times. The Africans were put in one side in the different uh, uh, neighborhoods, you know, um, and then, you know, the, the, the Europeans were on the other side. So this has continued as such. And Engsh is spoken, yes, by the, uh, the, the, the upper classes, young people. Although now, because of the same point, that Sheng is getting more prestige and more prestige, you'll find that a lot of, uh, when I was doing my interviews, I would find some you know, very you know, wealthy young uh, you know, men and women, and I said, do you speak Sheng? Yeah, of course I do. Yeah. And then I said, say a few things. <laughs> They're just talking English, you know, really. They don't really know, but they would like to. Okay, because it, you know, street cred, don't you? Street cred, as they call it. You know, you 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 show you're in things. You're not a softie, you know, because when you speak Sheng, you're obviously classified as you know. As, so yeah, Sheng uh, Abdulaziz came up with this term. Some people disagree with it. They simply say, as I am sort of you know beginning to argue that even Sheng also is a sort of something on a continuum, not necessarily as something very distinct to be given an aim for itself. Uh, so, so the same thing with Engsh. In fact, it's a reversal of, of, of the two. Um, uh, um, because back in 95, I think the term was coined you know, from Swahili. Swahili and, and English, right? Uh, presumably, this is what produced, uh, uh, sorry, uh, from English, right? Swahili and English. Not sure what the, the H presumably was just put in there for, for a reason, yeah? <laughs> to make it sound better. And then uh, Abdul, uh, Abdulaziz coined this and reversed that around and called it Engsh. 
to give prominence to English as the matrix, you know, if, you know in, in, my, in my explanation. Yeah? So that's the, only, that's the only thing. So it's basically English, upper class Kenyan English, again, okay? Kenyan educated English, right, with Swahili in, thrown in and a lot of other Sheng words, yeah. Um, but I don't focus too much on that. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, Sheng, I find it a lot more of interest there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm wondering about the Sheng serves to fill the communicative gap created by what by variation in levels of competence and how this can be actually verified or tested. So mm -hmm. that's one. And the other one is because if the idea is so there's so much variety of languages that are spoken and they're not so competent and so they create something extra instead of building on one or the other. Yes. So I'm wondering what what the logic of that could be. Of you know, I mean, they're all speaking certain kinds of languages and certain, and mm -hmm. that's the higher upper class does that too. So why would it be hard for them then to switch into sharing? So uh, what I'm asking yeah, is, no, you think I understand. motivation how mm -hmm. this could fill a communicative gap. Yes. Okay, I I, I think I understand. It's a good question. Um, now what I mean here is that. Yes, I'm talking about English and Kiswahili mainly, the national languages yeah. and the languages which you would be expected to use to communicate inter-ethnic, you know, with people, other Kenyans of different linguistic backgrounds. But as I said before, uh, Kiswahili, standard Swahili, which we watch on television, which was on the news and which we learn in school, is actually not widely spoken on the ground, okay? Okay, and, uh, and people are very much aware of it. You know? There is a, some kind of you know, um, stigmatization about the competent levels of Kiswahili. Uh, people keep complaining it's too hard. I don't know enough vocabulary. I get stuck in vocabulary when I'm trying to express myself fully in Kiswahili. And so I throw in you know, one word of English and so on and so forth. The same thing applies for English. I mean, yes, book English, standard English. People are learning everything in English in school. But that's only in the classroom. Okay. Once outside this, the, the classroom, the English is not really there. Even in the upper classes, you know, it's, it's more, may, may, sorry, maybe in the upper classes you might use English more inside the home state. Mm -hmm. But in the rest of the, of the, of the country, uh, most people will not be using any standard form within the community, except maybe the vernacular. Okay? But now the vernacular is stigmatized. You know, like all many other Af Kenyan African languages, you find that... Um, at least uh, outside the household, people are uh, find. Uh, they, yes, we have been. They have been. We have been led to believe that um, it is not polite, you know, to speak in your mother tongue, right? Outside your household or outside your community. That's what I mean by that gap. Okay, is being filled by this other mixed code, right? Which comes out neutral, you know, because it has everything in it. But I don't really under, I mean, if you measure this against what a standard variety is mm -hmm. that no one ever used anyways, mm -hmm. then for the people that never use it anyways, It is a perception. It is a perception. The problem doesn't arise, right? Because they speak mm -hmm. three, four languages and they have the ways of communicating. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, seems, it sounds more like an ideological problem, not a practical problem because they've been all the time in well, many languages. That's why mm -hmm. they're also multi-competent in different languages and mm -hmm. know to switch here to this right, and there to right. that and there to that. So yeah. then I'm okay. not so sure why there's a communicative gap. And if the communicative gap only is like a construct from like a normative view mm -hmm. that but actually doesn't exist on the ground, because why would you pick up a youth language that is seen as a lower class language to fill a gap that actually it's not mm -hmm. your gap, but it's the gap of that's created mm -hmm. ideology. That's why I'm asking, but mm -hmm. it would be, how would you like mm -hmm. test this? The other one is what I was wondering about is this notion of people are conscious or not conscious about using something, but I think that applied to the code mixes and code switches, right? So you mm -hmm. explained that there's a, they use this as a contextualization device to create intimacy, right? To create mm -hmm. alignment. Mm -hmm. Solidarity. Well. Solidarity, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting what you said about mm -hmm. that people feel that 
it's too complicated. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, I, I'm not sure, I don't know enough vocabulary because, mm -hmm. because I also, it's, it might be community, but I think maybe it is to do also with, you know, the, the term I'm thinking of is ownership. Ownership. Of, you know, appropriation. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not sure to what extent that's still there, but, but there is a history of, of Swahili and standardization of Swahili, which goes back to colonial times. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wonder whether that still sort of lingers. And, and in some sense, what we are seeing here is, is more of a community saying, yes, it's our language, but it's our language on our terms. On our terms. I think, uh, yeah. Can you get it? yeah, uh, yeah. So in that sense, yes, you're right. It is ideological more than, you know, than actually a, a, a question of actual normative competence in that sense, right? Right, but what, what, yeah. I, what I'm wondering So the, 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 the incompetence that is felt by the individual <laughs> is linked to that point and the ideology behind it. Yes. It's not my language, you know, and... And it's kind of linked to mm -hmm. what is the data that is underlying this, right? Because interview data is a meta-judgment of what you think you do. And some it's of the data is just collected spontaneously. It's yeah, not... so that's it's, why, it's, why it, I'm wondering, it, right, this interview, if I, if I tell you what I think, why I speak which language, that has something to do with how I want to... Uh, okay. So, but don't worry, I mean, this is a long discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it goes back to precisely that point, what you mean by the word Swahili, if you ask somebody. Yeah. Uh, you ask Swahili. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. just a load of questions. Yeah. Um, and and the, you know, people mentioned the other context, it's, it's very much replicated also in South Africa with Zulu, or mm -hmm. other South African languages. There's rural Zulu, which is codified, that has a grammar book and a textbook mm -hmm. that people learn in school. But nobody you, speaks it on yes, the street. Yes, and then you yeah. ask people, do you speak Zulu, and they say no by which they mean they don't speak this sort of codified role thing. And then they go to Zulu, yeah. and you go like, but, but that you speak, so, no, 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 that's not really Zulu. Absolutely. That's, and then, you know, it's Totsital or Kamso or whatever. But, but it is, of course, of course it's Zulu. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's really, that it's, 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 that's in a battle of what, you know, who owns Zulu. Right, right, Zulu. right. Yeah. And I think you're referring to that table, which is, you know, very, that was very particular to that, uh, to, oh. to the rural situation. I think what, uh, well, yes. sorry, what, what, it's self-report. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a survey, right? That's right, because, that, because it's a survey. And, and I, when I, you look at the categories in the survey, mm -hmm. the categories, 23, mm -hmm. it says homestead, street, school, and solidarity can be in all of them, right? It can be, so but I asked them to... You have the categories there, it's different. Yeah, you yeah. can use solidarity to speak shame in school, whisper yeah. it to your classmates. Okay. But, yeah, I mean, all these levels of language, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more yeah. like why, not where. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, this can be conflated at some point, but I thought it's useful to make a distinction because when I use mother tongue, for example, for example, the category of mother tongue, or vernacular, you can notice here it's not there because they are so loaded, right? They are so loaded. If you ask anybody, what's your vernacular, they almost feel offended somehow, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. so I, you know, first language. Well, you see, mother tongue in this in urban. Well, this is a rural situation, but in urban centers, that becomes also very complicated, because now the household. You know, I prefer the household language because now the household language is not necessarily the mother tongue nor the father tongue, so to speak. In fact, it's the sheng a lot of times. You, I, I've, learned, I've been taught by my Africanist friends not to ask that question because the notion of mother tongue is not something you can easily apply. It's not. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's it's uh, it, it's difficult because for for that reason. Uh, but my question, I think the question earlier you were posing, uh, you you uh, in addition to that is, I'm wondering why would somebody say this, right? If, it, you know, if they're competent in English and Kiswahili, for example, is that so more or less what you're also asking? Um, oh. In a nutshell, yes. Yeah, you know. Yes. And, 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 and I think on that note, actually, we have to... Oh, okay, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, thank you. Yeah, we but can carry on, yeah. It's a good question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very, very much for... Okay, thank you very much.